Welcome back, everybody. We're going to uh, start the second portion of today's webinar where we're going to take a deeper dive into the law of covert action. Uh, I'm going to ask Bobby to start by talking about what this is. What do we mean by uh, covert action? Uh, it has a very specific legal definition, but I, I think the most important feature of it is the idea that the hand of the U.S. government uh, is supposed to be hidden or even deniable. And, and that poses a special challenge for democracy. If the idea of uh, our, our sort of uh, Republican form of, of democracy is that we uh, uh, elect officials, we hold them accountable through periodic elections, that's premised on the ability to know what uh, our elected officials are doing or not doing. Uh, and uh, covert action is all about denying uh, what the U.S. government is actually doing, or or hiding what the U.S. government is is doing. So there's a special uh, a special challenge for democracy there. Uh, this is important not just um, sort of normatively because we believe in checks on power, but also because we want to ensure effectiveness. We want covert action to work effectively. It's an area uh, that is very uh, uh, fraught with all kinds of policy dangers and the possibility of blowback, something Bobby will, will no doubt talk about when he's going through the history of US covert action. Uh, but those are just some, some thoughts to sort of start things off. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bobby, thanks. Without further ado, let's jump right in with the law of, of covert action. Um, as Matt said, you, you really have to begin with the uh, question of, wait, what exactly do we mean by covert action? But as a pre prelude to that, that will be the first substantive thing I talk about. Let me just emphasize our roadmap for this particular topic. So we're going to start with what we mean by covert action and how does that relate to democracy and the rule of law. Um, then we're going to talk about the origins and evolution of the CIA and what we want to focus on are first, what exactly is the was the original basis for it to be even engaging in covert action? Like, what's the democratic legitimacy of the United States during the early Cold War of having gone down this pathway to begin with? Then we'll note a moment where the tensions between uh, the country's sort of collective desire to have some such activities taking place but then the revulsion in some quarters at realizing what some of those activities had entailed, how that became a flashpoint. And there was tremendous uh, legislative consequence to that and, and other consequences. Uh, the result will be a legal architecture that has these central features, presidential findings and reporting to Congress. And then we'll close with the survey of the, uh, what we can call the thou shalt not, anything that's been identified as substantively off limits under this general heading. So without further ado, um, what are we talking about when we talk about covert action? Covert action is not like collection. It's distinct from collection of information and intelligence, what we think of as espionage, because it is about impacting events. The, the formal definition in the US statutory system is that this is a label we put on any activity, whether conducted by the CIA or not, any US government activity that is designed to affect events overseas. Now, the statutory definition talks about political, economic, and military uh, circumstances, but it's, it's really meant to be sort of a, a sweeping, not exclusive definition, but an inclusive one. You're trying to influence overseas events, and what makes it covert is that the sponsoring role of the United States government is not meant to be apparent or acknowledged. So the event itself might be detected, but the United States will not uh, acknowledged that it was the author or arranged for that event to occur or made that thing happen. Uh, that's to be contrasted, for example, with uh, a, a term that's often used really loosely, uh, the more commonly used military term, clandestine activity. Clandestine, uh, properly understood as a connotation of the activity itself not being detected, though the U.S. sponsoring role might be acknowledged, might not be, it depends, um, covert means that we're, we're denying that it was us that did it, if it was detected at all. Now, covert action, having that function performed in a rule of law society and in a democracy seems like naturally raises some tensions there. It's, it's worth kind of drilling down on that a bit right at the outset. How exactly might covert action be thought to clash with rule of law values in particular? Not democracy values, but rule of law values. 
And it's interesting because it's not obvious there is a clash if by rule of law you're referring only to American law, to U.S. domestic law, as we'll talk about later on, as we mentioned in, in, in the earlier segment about the foundations of the intelligence community's legal framework. Um, U.S. intelligence activities all must comply with the Constitution and the laws of the United States. Um, so from that perspective, there's no clash on the rule of law dimension. But that perspective shifts if you take a more cosmopolitan perspective and you start asking about um, the larger sovereignty-based concept of the rule of law, where every state should be entitled to have control over what goes on within its own borders, have the last word in the law. And if we have a function, the essence of which is to go abroad and try to cause things to happen overseas in ways that would in almost every instance would necessarily violate the local law of that other country, then in that sense, there's a rule of law tension. That's endemic and in, in, in unavoidable in the context of covert action. And by the way, the same thing is true about run-of-the-mill espionage. Run-of-the-mill espionage is going to violate the law of the other country where the espionage is occurring. Um, that's what makes it espionage. Um, to a certain extent, that's why the covert action tool exists. Um, the greater tension, I would argue, is with a separate uh, set of values, and that's uh, democracy values, the, the, the role of self-governance. Um, here, covert action presents for us, w whatever the covert action activity is, because it, it is by definition secret and not acknowledged that the US government is causing something to happen or trying to cause something to happen, it necessarily creates a democratic accountability gap um, and so there's, there's a straightforward tension there, no question about it. Um, it's perhaps a flip side version of that if and when a covert action the United States might undertake is meant to affect electoral accountability in some other country or governance accountability in some case, such as election interference. And we're going to talk about uh, an early example of that in a moment and putting it in a light that, at least to me, is, is an appealing light. Okay. Yeah, Bobby, can, yes. I, I want to make sure that we get to this. So I'm not sure whether this is a question for now or, or later, but I, I do want to press on this issue of election interference because, you know, for, for the last few years, we've been um, complaining loudly and appropriately about uh, Russian election interference or political interference. Um, uh, uh, aimed at us. Uh, we're talking, though, in covert action about a set of activities that the United States has engaged in historically, um, a lot of which is about uh, interfering in foreign government's politics. Uh, so is there, do, do you see a, a, a tension there, and how would you, how would you explain it? Right. There, there's no question there's a tension. I mean, you can say there's no tension because that was then, this is now. Um, Certainly, if you look at the history of publicly known U.S. covert action programs, um, starting with the post-World War II period, as we will in a moment, and rolling forward from there, the first several decades where the name of the game was uh, fighting the Cold War and trying to prevent uh, the growth of the Soviet sphere of influence uh, in particular, where the Soviets were heavily engaged in covert action to advance uh, the prospects for uh, pro-Moscow parties in other countries. Um, the United States very much got involved in exactly the, you know, the opposite uh, effort. And so we were interfering frequently, sometimes very dramatically, in uh, other countries' electoral and other governance selection processes. Clearly, there's a tension there. Now, that does, to be clear, when there's, when there's that sort of hypocrisy risk, it's not that you can't do something and then try to stop someone else from doing so. You obviously would like to be able to be effective yourself while completely foiling your opponent. Um, just as we might say, wow, the, the Chinese hack of OPM that got all that useful information a few years back, we can say we really wish we could have stopped that. We can try really hard to stop it even though we do similar things. That's not inconsistent. What would be inconsistent is if you bring to bear normative criticism, uh, let alone legal criticism, of what's been going on. You say that that is clearly illegal, that crossed a line, that's not okay. Um, we can make those kinds of arguments, but then there's a hypocrisy risk. But as I said a moment ago, 
it's been a long time, at least as far as I know and as far as the public record reveals, it's been a long time, decades and decades, since the United States has been in that particular version of the covert action game. So you can try to have it both ways and say that we, we would have been hypocrites complaining about what Russia did in 2016 if we were still doing what we did long before many of us were born. But it's been a long time since then. We don't do that. And at some point, we are able, without being hypocrites, to say that this crossed a line. You could also try to avoid the tension by saying, look, it's, it's one thing when we do it where there's a contested election and, and another power is driving the uh, election in a certain direction using its own covert action program. And what we're doing is trying to counteract that. But that's different from a circumstance where a country has no particular interference going on and someone else tries to intervene in the first instance. You can try to play that game as well. I'm not, I'm not sure uh, how well that argument will hold up. But I think we'll probably come back to this example a fair amount. Uh, I think the key takeaway is the fact that we might not be able to criticize something normatively doesn't mean we have to then say, all right, you're free to do that to us. Far from it. Okay, um, I think we've, we've set on the table the, the overarching tension that covert action activity uh, represents, and therefore we can begin to see the outlines of where, when designing the legal architecture, what the values are we're trying to balance. We want to have this capacity to further national interest, but we want to guard against the rule of law values at home and the, especially the democratic accountability uh, problems at home. And so that's what we'll be looking for. Let's talk now about the, uh, the, the central agency, you might say. Sorry, I'm a dad. I do dad jokes. The central agency tasked with uh, carrying out covert action in our system, the CIA. Historically, there was no CIA. It was an open field. Uh, it's not that there was nothing occurring for the first century and a half of the United States existence. There was, it's not that there was nothing occurring that could be described as covert action. Presidents had their secret funds. They could and did uh, secretly expend unaccounted for monies for agents to carry out particular missions uh, of interest, often in the nature of basically covert di diplomatic efforts, but sometimes probably involving some, some propagandizing here and there overseas. Uh, so there was this sort of activity that happened at a, at a low level of intensity episodically and without institutionalization. When does it begin to change and, and take on institutional uh, trappings? Well, uh, in the run up to World War II, or sh I should say the American role in World War II, uh, a first and early step down this path was when Roosevelt, FDR, uh, created the coordinator of information position, which was initially very narrow. It was basically an, an analysis coordination mechanism. You had the State Department with its diplomatic means and the War Department and the Navy Departments with their uh, intelligence collection capabilities, all providing separate streams of information and, and other odds and ends besides. And FDR wanted to bring in uh, his friend uh, Wild Bill Donovan uh, to take on this role of being the one point of per sort of the interagency coordinator. It was, it's almost like a uh, almost a fusion center, if you will. But the task also included such other supplementary activities as might facilitate securing information too. And, and that pretty quickly, once the United States was in World War II, transmuted into the uh, Office of Strategic Services, the legendary OSS. The OSS clearly had collection activities. It had the, the original you know, analysis function. But then in addition to those had, quote, such special services as may be directed, and famously, the OSS became involved not just in the informing phase of intelligence activity, but the doing phase, influencing events overseas, especially uh, though not only in the European theater. And so you had wartime covert action all over the place with the OSS and a lot of legends born from that. But it's wartime and perhaps that sort of a dramatic daring do would be a temporary institutional innovation. Um, when the war ended and everything kind of began seeming like it might return to normal, uh, there were plenty of people who were ready to see OSS be folded up. Certainly wasn't popular with the State Department, 
wasn't popular with the War Department, wasn't popular with the Navy Department. There was bureaucratic rivalry, a sense that they were, you know, they were, they were cowboys. I mean, Wild Bill Donovan wasn't given that nickname for, for nothing. Um, and Truman himself had complicated views about it. But long story short, did roll up OSS pretty quickly. He, he disbanded it and then created something else in its stead fairly quickly, the Central Intelligence Group. And you can kind of see the bones of continuity across time with these things. CIG, CIG was to analyze intelligence and it was to perform central coordinating functions, a lot like the intelligence coordinator position FDR had originally had in mind. And it looked on its face like CIG, CIG would kind of go back to that model, taking out all the daring do, all the covert action-like elements. But the order from President Truman included on the enumerated list of affirmative authorities of CIG, quote, such other functions and duties related to intelligence infect, affecting the national security as might be directed. And, and so you see that language just keeps getting carried forward in time. And what's happening, of course, is that in the course of massaging the development of these institutions, all done not by statute, by the way, but by executive branch uh, directive. Um, the president, both FDR and Truman, are trying to keep the door open for possibilities, tasks that they may ultimately decide to charge that institution with carrying out. And clearly, even in the case of the OSS, an allergy to ever formally talking publicly about covert action because, after all, it's supposed to be covert. And if you want to have a function where U.S. government agents are doing things that the U.S. government will deny that it is having done, maybe it's a smart step, maybe, uh, on an efficacy dimension and an efficiency dimension to not ever talk publicly about even having such a capacity. What's the problem with that? Problem with that is that exacerbates the democratic accountability deficit that this sort of activity necessarily entails, even if the public knows that somebody's doing something like that. How much more is the deficit if the public doesn't even know that there is such an agency with such a function? Well, that's sort of the name of the game in the post-World War II period. Um, pretty quickly, 1947, Congress intervenes with the National Security Act of 1947. This, is, this was a big deal. It was an organic uh, foundational statute uh, creating the institutional architecture that dominated the Cold War period, um, the creation of the Secretary of Defense and the sort of the unification of the services and that to that extent, um, a lot of other bells and whistles, but including conversion of Truman's Central Intelligence Group into the now statutorily chartered Central Intelligence Agency. And so there it is, 1947, the birth of the CIA. There is a subsequent statute, the CIA statute, the CIA Act, that spells out a lot for the CIA, but it's the National Security Act that gives rise to it. Um, so the question therefore becomes, what was it meant to do when they made this thing? What was it supposed to go out and do? Uh, has a list that is borrowed directly from Truman's list that he in turn had developed from FDR's prior list, advising functions, centralized coordination functions, uh, express reference to analysis functions, express reference to common services, and then a catch-all reference, once again, the same phrase that is listed as the fifth function on this list of CIA missions, such other functions and duties as may be directed. This is gonna become known because of that enumeration as the fifth function. And for a long time, the fifth function was a euphemism for covert action. Now, please note that it also needs to be the euphemism, actually, for a collection. CIA is our nation's uh, premier general purpose human collection agency. It has all, it has, is a general purpose collection agency. Collection is a central function of what the CIA does, uh, probably more so even than covert action, though it does both. Um, neither one's actually spelled out in so many words. Instead, you have the catch-all. But again, fifth function comes to be sort of synonymized with the idea of covert action. And again, you see an unwillingness to speak in formal public settings about actually having this particular mission. And so a democratic accountability issue is sort of baked in at the beginning and a practical question, would this even be a mission that the CIA would understand itself to be uh, charged with performing? 
And would the powers that be in the executive branch, especially the president acting by, with, and through the National Security Council, would the NSC process view CIA as having this mission? Uh, we got an answer to that question uh, really quickly in our national life. But before we get to it, let me, let me flag one clue that they did put in the statute, not on purpose, but it's a clue nonetheless. The statute had an express set of limitations, one of which was the CIA shall have no police, subpoena, law enforcement, or internal security function. If the CIA was meant only to analyze information collected by others, provide advice and coordination services, that would be a heck of a strange caveat to include. It's relatively clear that Congress in the National Security Act is best understood as having understood that the CIA would in fact under the fifth function do a variety of hands-on things in the overseas realm. And for that reason, they felt it important to include this caveat for the domestic realm. All right. Um, I said that very quickly, we got an answer on covert action, or at least we learned what the National Security Council and the Truman administration thought that the CIA ought to be able to go do. It included covert action. In December, in the winter of 1947-48, with elections looming in the uh, still devastated areas of Western Europe that were not under communist control already, there was a real risk that communist parties might take power uh, in France and Italy. And the Russians, the Soviets were doing what they could to make that come to pass. Uh, they were pouring covert action efforts of their own into those elections. CIA is given the task by the National Security Council of intervening in similar fashion. And the directive from the National Security Council expressly cited the fifth function as the statutory basis for CIA to be able to quote, to, to conduct quote, covert psychological operations, close quote, to counteract these election interference campaigns. And I don't wanna be euphemistic about that, to, to conduct our own election interference uh, course, finally, to try to keep France and Italy in the, in the Western uh, camp. Now, why turn to CIA for this? Why not ask the CIA to distribute, I mean, sorry, the State Department to distribute funds, maybe even covertly? Why not ask uh, the military to do this? It's Western Europe. The military is all over Western Europe. There are a lot of, inst of longstanding institutions on the ground who have this capability, but the brand new CIA was given the task instead. And here's what the NSC wrote. They observed that the similarity of operational methods involved in what they wanted, which was covert psychological warfare, intelligence activities, you know, propaganda, basically. The similarity between what you need for that and the general need to ensure secrecy and to avoid costly duplication of effort makes the CIA the logical agency to conduct such operations. What's going on? Well, the idea was CIA is expected to be out there conducting espionage, to be in Western Europe in these places conducting espionage, to establish the relationships, to establish the ability to function covertly, to be necessary to be most effective. And the NSC, I think quite correctly observed that it made no sense to try to get the War Department or the, the, the new def Defense Department or the State Department to develop the capability to do those things, which you'd also need if you were going to start doing covert action in the form of election interference and, and propaganda operations. So both because they felt that the National Security Act authorized it and that as a matter of policy, the CIA was the right entity to do it. The White House, in effect, charged the CIA with getting involved in those elections. And I uh, actually don't know if this particular poster is a propaganda poster from that time. It's an anti-communist Italian election poster. Maybe that's one of the fruits of the effort. Either way, uh, it turns out that the pro-Western parties prevailed both in Italy and France and history pivoted uh, in a way that could have been far, far worse for US interest had it gone the other way. The next year, the uh, Cold War is accelerating and taking shape, and the National Security Council gives a much broader and more ambitious directive to the fledgling CIA involving covert action. And I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to inflict death by PowerPoint and read this slide. I leave it there. You can kind of get the sense of it just by scanning across it, and you'll see not just the words, uh, word propaganda, but you'll see economic warfare, 
uh, sabotage, demolition, subversion, assistance to underground, resistance movements, guerrillas. The public wasn't seeing this, but the Cold War was off to a hot start and the CIA was tasked with performing covertly a frontline role in it. And that's from 1948, so right at the creation. Now, all sorts of activities follow from this. And, I, and by highlighting some of the ones that have, that have been more controversial over time or that were uglier or, or that failed in various ways, short and long term, I don't mean to suggest, uh, as often happens, like, well, this, this is what it was all about. Um, we're, this, this recitation sort of skips over all the bread and butter activity that was so central in the multi-decade struggle with the Soviets. Um, still, uh, we got to highlight some of the most strategically significant things that happened, such as the 1953 Operation Ajax intervention in Iran, uh, which, which toppled uh, Mossadegh and ensured uh, the Shah's power for generation, a generation or so to come, which of course eventually sets the table for, for the countervailing uh, 1979 revolution in Iran. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Bay of Pigs, another famous example. This one did not go well in the short term. Um, and I don't think it needs any elaboration. The, uh, the attempt um, spilling over from the Eisenhower administration, which set the table, and then the Kennedy administration, which carried it forward, uh, the ill-fated and almost farcical attempt to invade Cuba in 61. This is just meant to carry us forward into that early 1970s period that I described earlier as a flashpoint. So what's going on that makes it a flashpoint? We get from 1948 into the early 70s with decades of covert action taking place and, and the full spectrum of it from highly kinetic warlike activity in, in, the, uh, in the area of the Vietnam theater um, and to rather kinetic things going on elsewhere with the Soviets around the world and, and also more run of the mill things. Why in the 1970s suddenly do things shift? Because they certainly did. And there are a host of reasons. First of all, at that point, we had had uh, years and years of mounting political tension and division in our country over the Vietnam War. We had the counterculture. We had Watergate. We had a general collapse of trust in institutions and above all, trust in the national security components of the US government, maybe not above all, but certainly at the top rank, um, combining in a way that among other things led to election to Congress of a substantial number of members who were willing to get involved and motivated and interested in getting involved both in their oversight functions, but also in their lawmaking functions in ways that had never been true up to that point in US history, uh, including throughout the first two decades of the Cold War. That's a dramatic sea change. For the CIA, oh, let, me, let me add another element. So that's happening in Congress. Secondly, in the media sphere, the, the once very cozy relationship between journalists and major media platforms and the White House, not anymore, not at this stage in the Nixon uh, presidency, to say the least. It's a new generation. All these factors combined towards a form of watchdog and expose journalism that hadn't been there before. And bit by bit, as a result of all of this, information about some of the least savory, most controversial things that CIA covert action was doing, and maybe even a few things they, they weren't actually doing, but sounded, sounded like they might be, um, began to be known to the public. These forces combine a, a, re a Congress ready for reform, a media shining spotlights on things that didn't used to come to public attention, and a public that's you know, had it with everybody, they combined to form legislative interest in creating new statutory constraints to try to pull back in some way to, to corral um, what some described as the rogue elephant, as if it was all CIA's idea, not the White House's idea, uh, to do what they'd been doing. Either way, that was, that was a lot of interest in, in creating new legal re mechanisms that would somehow pull back. Now, one possibility, if you really want to solve such a puzzle, if you think that there's a rogue elephant problem with covert action, why not abolish covert action? Why not amend the National Security Act to make clear that there shall be no activity to influence events abroad where the U.S. sponsoring role is not apparent or acknowledged? You could do that. But even in the uh, flashpoint years of the, the early to mid-1970s, uh, that never had serious momentum behind it. Even the most ardent reformers, for the most part, were looking to mend it, not 
end it, to borrow a phrase. What they wanted to do was to create mechanisms that would in some sense uh, prevent the, the more problematic forms of covered action while leaving the overall capability at least somewhat still in place. How do you do that? You can't really pass a statute that says, don't do dumb things. Don't do abusive things. You're going to have to be more specific than that. If you want to spell out in a thou shalt not sort of way, you're going to have to name names as it were. You're going to have to spell out particular scenarios with some degree of granularity saying this is not okay. We're going to have a covered action mechanism, but it can't be used for X. If you're not confident, if you want to go that path, but you're not confident you can articulate what you're trying to forbid, or in any event, if you're worried that you might articulate two or three obvious things, maybe you'll prohibit, oh, I don't know, assassination, more on that later. You come up with your list, you might be worried that there's still all sorts of other stupid, abusive things that you didn't think of in advance. And therefore, you might then grope for other statutory tools that maybe in a more generic, systematic way might result in just better decision making. How, how might that work? Well, you can pass statutory rules to regulate the decision-making process itself, both in how decisions are made and then who is informed of them in order to manipulate the incentives of the decision-makers in a way that you hope will nudge the decision-maker towards less problematic activity while still leaving them with enough flexibility and discretion to do what you do want them to do. That's basically what happens in 1974. So this is interesting. Um, in the news at that time, just sort of the latest example of things that have been in the news recently that were causing both the public and members of a reform-minded Congress to be anxious were revelations and allegations about covert action activity in Chile and involving uh, the Allende administration and the coup that toppled Allende. Um, the amount of anxiety about that was a little bit of a match on an already well-primed fire. And there was legislation moving through Congress that would, for the first time, create a mechanism of oversight formally in the law where, where the CIA would have to uh, report things to at least some part of Congress. And indeed, that you might have to do it in a way that required the president to be accountable for what the CIA was doing. That is to say, to eliminate the phenomenon of plausible deniability, which is the term of art for a scenario in which maybe the president does know, she can't prove it, and therefore the president can distance himself after the fact if something comes out and is unpopular or disastrous. Um, that was probably going to become law anyways in 74, but at this point in the year, in December of 1974, as the bill was nearing completion, that had this kind of mechanism in it. The New York Times had a blockbuster expose about domestic politically suppressive activity by the CIA targeting various parts of the anti-war movement and other uh, Nixon administration critics. Uh, this was this uh, famous Seymour Hersh article, which you see here, uh, kind of comes in as the coup de grace on any possibility that, that there would not be legislative intervention you see President Ford over on the left side of the screen there. He's in office now. It's not Nixon anymore. I, I don't know that he was going to veto this bill, but it becomes law after that. So let's meet the Hughes-Ryan Amendment, the, as it's known. This was the big first formal legislative inter intervention to try to corral the so-called rogue elephant. The Hughes-Ryan Amendment did both the things I just mentioned. It said that no funds appropriated under the authority of this or any other act can be spent by or for the CIA for, now notice the euphemisms here, for operations in foreign countries other than activities solely intended to collect intelligence. So that little bit of indirect language, of course, leaves the question of well, what activity is this talking about? What does the CIA do abroad that's not for collection purposes? Well, covert action. That's what they're trying to describe here. They, sh they still don't want to say the words. Uh, you can't do it anymore. You can't spend money on that anymore unless and until the president finds that each such operation is important to the national security of the United States. Now, there's more to it, but I want to focus first on the presidential finding requirement. I would argue this is a big deal, though not for the reason that's apparent on the face of the statute. The part I underlined here, 
the president is being directed and compelled or purportedly being compelled. I suppose there's an article two constitutional question about whether the president really can be bound this way, but I think that he has been bound this way. Um, what's he been bound to do? He has to make a finding that the operation is important to the national security of the United States. I would submit to you that's pretty easy to make fun of as, as a test that's not doing any real work, that it's almost inconceivable that there could be a situation where a president wants to authorize a covert action program, yet couldn't, couldn't bring himself or herself to issue such a finding that that standard has been met. Important to the United, to the United States national security is just not a very demanding standard. But, but that's not what really matters. What really matters is the requirement that the president sign onto it at all. It could, be a, it could be a finding that this activity won't bankrupt the United States. It could be a finding that it won't change the constel constellations in the sky. It doesn't matter what the president's certifying, so much as the fact that the president must personally take ownership of it and therefore cannot any longer have plausible deniability. This is a potentially powerful mechanism for changing incentives at the screening stage for covert action proposals because it harnesses the president's mighty political self-interest. And I don't want to be you know, too cynical about it. Also, the president's interest in the president's own policy program, which could get derailed if there's a political problem flowing from something that is a dumb or abusive idea that the president can't plausibly deny ownership over. In light of that harnessing of that interest, that will in turn and has in turn over time motivated the executive branch at the White House level to bring the machinery of White House interagency policymaking and, and staff screening to bear to vet proposals to a greater extent than was the case before. At least that's the good government account of how this is all meant to work. Simply put, the idea is that regardless of what the president must promise in the finding, the fact that the president himself must issue the finding means that the White House is going to care more than it might otherwise care about whether the proposal is too risky. That's a potentially powerful mechanism. It's not the only mechanism. There's also the oversight element of the Hughes-Ryan Amendment and what came afterwards. So the, the language, which I put back up here, continues on. And the language says uh, that that finding has to be reported in a timely fashion or a description and scope of the operation that the president has found uh, permissible has to be reported in a timely fashion to appropriate committees of Congress. And the original list was relatively long because a number of different committees claimed to have jurisdiction. And at that moment, there was no dedicated Senate and House uh, special committee just for intelligence. So now you've got a second mechanism, uh, and this one a transparency mechanism that feeds back into accountability and decision-making too. Because now it's clear that at least as long as this statute's going to be honored, covered action proposals, if they're adopted, they're, gonna, they're definitely going to be known by at least some members of Congress. And that prospect, the anticipation of someone looking over your shoulder to know what you're doing, obviously social science and common sense and experience dictates that it'll add a nudging factor, hopefully helping again to deter potentially uh, abusive or unduly bad ideas without going too far the other direction and chilling all possible activity that might actually be needed. So a lot of, a lot of activity in both directions in the 1970s. A lot happens between the early 1970s and the creation of this framework and 1980 and the passage of the Intelligence Oversight Act. Uh, most critically, and this goes back to uh, Matt, your theme of the pendulum that swings uh, between moments of anxiety where the country and its government really want the intelligence community to be aggressive and moments of repose where we focus more on uh, controlling and reining them in and potentially complaining about what they've been doing in the other periods. 1979 it was a pivot point year in international relations history as, as students of history know. Uh, the Soviet in invasion of Afghanistan, the Iranian revolution, which I mentioned earlier, the hostage crisis in Iran, uh, all sorts of additional activities, uh, the, the Grand Mosque and the, and the uh, incident there in Saudi Arabia, the world suddenly looked far scarier and the pendulum was swinging really fast in 1979. 
back in the, hey, America is living in a dangerous neighborhood, has dangerous adversaries sort of direction. The Intelligence Oversight Act of 1980 accordingly does a few tweaks that by no means guts the Hughes-Ryan Amendment, but there is some tweaking here, some, some tightening, and there's two things I want to highlight. First of all, this multiplicity of congressional committees that were receiving reports about covert action programs, that gets narrowed. At this point, we've got the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, Sissy and Hipsy. They're made the only recipients of these notifications. So the rest of the committees were, were cut out, the, the other ones that were involved. And, and also um, a, a separate mechanism for the most sensitive covered action programs was created so that you could have even narrower disclosure. In certain special circumstances, the president could choose to narrow the disclosure to the so-called gang of eight. That is the, the, the ranking and minority members of both the intelligence committees plus the, the two leadership positions in both houses. So eight members only if the president really feels that the risk of a leak or, or, or hostile congressional action is, is so significant relative to the sensitivity of the program. So uh, in those two respects, by 1980, the pendulum swing causes reporting to be narrowed. And the way to think about this is that we went from having only the most informal and limited forms of disclosures to Congress to a relatively broadly framed statutory disclosure obligation, which you know, had a potentially strong incentivizing effect that maybe even was a bit uh, a bit too chilling, at least some might have thought in the 1970s. And so then when there comes a moment in world affairs where it seems more dangerous, you get a pivot swing back in the other direction, not a sharp swing, but just a, a modest uh, tightening of the oversight framework. Bobby, can I jump in yeah. there? Uh, and, and you may want to elaborate on these issues uh, as we go and you talk about subsequent reforms. But uh, first, just a, a comment. It's striking that... Um, You've talked about several rounds of a statutory regulation of covert action. All of it is essentially um, procedural in nature, right? Congress is not coming in, as you said, and saying, here's what you, exactly what you can do, and here are a bunch of things you can't. It's almost entirely process, about process. What has to happen internal to the executive branch? What has to be notified and in, in, in when and so on to, to Congress? So that's one striking feature of law in this area. Uh, my sense is also, though, that along the way, at each of these points, when there's a discussion of possible statutory reform, uh, there's a, sort of two very uh, opposite, conflicting types of criticisms of congressional action here. One is that it's too weak, uh, that Congress isn't doing enough. Uh, it's imposing only the barest, most minimal uh, kind of procedural requirements on the president. Uh, it's these procedural requirements are themselves filled with uh, ambiguous terms and so on. Uh, Congress, if it were serious about regulating covert action, if it were serious about oversight, uh, would need to impose much tighter requirements. That's kind of a critique from one side. Coming a, a completely different angle of critique is that all of this is way too constraining. That, a wor that the world of covert action is one where there is special imperative for secrecy, agility, flexibility, speed on the part of the executive branch. And even these procedural requirements um, risk undermining um, the very effectiveness of covert action upon which our national security depends. So it, it, is, is that a fair characterization of the critiques? Um, and how do each of those kind of play out in these negotiations? Absolutely fair. Um, you have an uh, irresistible force and immovable object type of tension here, where uh, starting first with the critique that Congress is, is feckless and that these interventions just, whatever good they may have done, th this really doesn't uh, provide the kind of constraint we need. Uh, for those who come at it from that perspective, they're reinforced by all the political science literature, like the work of Amy Ziegart, uh, documenting how uh, the motivations of members of Congress to act, uh, shall we say, don't really 
in most cases, drive them systematically towards being aggressive in the use of the powers they might bring to bear, uh, thanks to learning about what's going on in covert action, or, or related to that, if they're not learning about what they need to learn about, using their powers to force disclosures that should be happening with more detail than they are. Um, and this has to do with what the literature shows about what the priorities of congressmen and women are, what they are willing to invest their time and their political capital in. It has a lot to do with what you're likely to be rewarded for in terms of reelection. Um, that said, it raises a question like, well, what can they do anyways? What's realistic for them? Maybe they don't have any powers. They've got the power to expose. They've got the power to leak, which is a highly problematic yet very real form of power. They've got the power to pursue legislation. They've got the power to make oversight painful. They've got the power to uh, disrupt nominations, more to the point, confirmations, if you're on the Senate side. They have an array of tools uh, they can use to bring to bear uh, if they want to pressure when they learn of something or need to learn more about something. It's the motivation that's missing in many instances. It, the sad fact is that when, when there is motivation, it tends to be deployed and there, there are some noble exceptions to this, let me say first, but it tends to be deployed in the average case only when consistent with partisan interests as well. Again, there are notable exceptions, people for whom principles, uh, whether they come from the security perspective or the privacy perspective, there are plenty of members over time who've shown that that's what's driving their decision making. But the checking mechanisms of this interbranch separation uh, by far are more effective, it turns out, when you have opposite parties in control of the executive branch and, and Congress. Uh, coming from the other perspective, there's the camp that says that, look, um, it's, it's a tough enough world, the job of the intelligence community and especially the CIA conducting covert action is, is critical. And it's, yes, it's ugly, but it's, it's terribly important. It's hard enough without the friction that's introduced uh, through already what exists, let alone possibly stronger mechanisms. Uh, and in the 1970s, I mean, some of our politics down to this day and some of our policy disputes were rooted in this visceral division of opinion between we need to do more, we're already doing too much, of, of people who were in government then. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney and, and others who, who uh, would go on for, for many decades to come to have very significant views formed by this initial er moment in the debate. So the 70s is the first time we really faced these questions. Uh, it created a bit of an equilibrium because of the reform focus of the early part of the decade and the security focus of the tail end of the decade. Um, but the pendulum just keeps swinging between now and then uh, for a variety of reasons. I'll, I'll hit a few more of those pendulum swings here in a moment. So I don't know if that covers everything uh, it should have covered, but Matt, any further follow-up from you on that before I move on? Uh, I, I've got a bunch of other questions, but I think they're applicable to what's, what's about to come. Cool. Well, let me just note really quickly, because I'd be remiss if I didn't show you the citation for where um, the, the heart of it, what it was, Hughes Ryan, where it is today. 50 U.S. Code 3093 is your citation if you were looking for one, though I also should note that the part where the power of the purse is made the, uh, the, the fist behind the requirement, that's in 3094. So there's your requisite legal citation. How about another pendulum swing? Uh, the late 80s in the Iran-Contra affair gives us another sort of moment, not quite as intense, not nearly as intense as the reform moment of the early 70s, but here you had an off the books, unreported covert action program with intense national controversy. Um, the response, the real response came primarily in the form of Justice Department prosecutions of various persons involved, which is very interesting uh, to say the least, even if a lot of that was uh, blunted later on by pardons. Nonetheless, uh, intensive congressional investigation and then real criminal prosecutions. On the statutory reform side, you've got some change, which I'll highlight here in the form of uh, what is now Section 3091 of Title 50. Uh, it, it, in my view, I think it's best described as underscoring existing reporting requirements, uh, a requirement that the intelligence committees be kept fully and currently uh, informed of significant anticipated activities as well as current activities that might be taking place, 
and that uh, a caveat here as sort of the price, the back and forth of negotiation, clearly stating that that doesn't mean that Congress has to approve anything. Um, and then this bit, which was new, uh, anything illegal, illegality must be promptly reported, uh, as well as a prompt reporting of whatever corrective action has been taken is taking place. Now that obviously is trying to respond to the Iran-Contra affair. And Matt, as you said, again, we see Congress responding to one of the pendulum swings by reaching for procedural and transparency tools, repeatedly uh, really shying away from more substantive thou shalt not forms of intervention. Um, and yet there are some thou shalt not rules. So let me, let me get those on the table before we turn to just more open questions. Um, and you can find some of the key ones in statute 3093 subpart a5 uh, this is critical because it brings in a panoply of other laws a covert action finding cannot authorize action that would violate the constitution or any statute of the united states so it must be in compliance with all those rules now if you were listening to the earlier lecture it does in the audience in the earlier lecture i talked about the overall legal architecture including constitutional constraints um, and noting individual rights protections, but also noting that they largely don't pertain to persons who are not US persons or in the United States. So there's that consideration, that caveat. You might also wonder, are there any statutes that are really brought to bear here that really matter for covert action programs? Yes, yeah, sometimes, there certainly are some. And in, in the post 9-11 period, of course, the, the Torture Act and the War Crimes Act loomed incredibly largely and resulted in all sorts of legal gymnastics to avoid their effect. Why? Because covert action cannot violate those statutes. There is no such thing as a domestic legal argument that it's okay, I broke the War Crimes Act or the Torture Act because I was operating under color of Title 50. It was a covert action. That is not a legitimate legal move in our system. That's very important. Um, so American law kind of brought in sort of full swoop. Laws of other countries, of course, are going to be violated. Everyone understands that that's going to be true about any covert action, but that leaves something indeterminate. What about international law? Where does it enter into the picture? This is terribly important because covert action is going to be taking place in the international plane by definition. And if you look at 3093A5 there and look closely, you'll notice it's a reference to the constitution and to statutes it doesn't say anything about treaties, let alone customary international law of the land. You might think, well, treaties are treaties under the supremacy clause of the US Constitution. They're part of the Constitution. Well, they're not constitutional as such. They're not constitutional provisions. They are recognized in the Constitution as having the same uh, stature in our system as federal statutes, thus binding on the states and individuals. But this statute doesn't incorporate them. It express, not expressly, I guess, it implicitly but very purposely omits the whole category from the set of things that covert action must comply with. The strong textual implication being that this is an implied green light for a covert action program to put, not, not to violate international law like that's just okay, but to knowingly put the United States in violation of its international law obligations, which is a portentous and significant thing. But at Matt, as you well know, um, there's a larger set of concepts around the authority of the president to choose to put us into violation. That doesn't mean it's not a violation. It's choosing uh, to breach, as it were, rather like an efficient breach theory you might see in, in uh, contract law. This is controversial, no question about it. But it's critical if you want to understand descriptively how covert action actually works in the U.S. legal system, you must appreciate that it's not just foreign law that a Title 50 covert action is understood to have a green light to potentially breach. Now, does that mean we don't care about international law? Let me give you this rare glimpse we got during the confirmation hearing of, of Carolyn Kraft to be CIA's general counsel some years ago, where there were questions exactly about this, and she was very forthright in describing how the CIA approaches this. And, and former General Counsel Steve Preston has also talked about this. And so we've got a few glimpses behind the curtain that are instructive. And the, the question had been presented, um, are covert actions 
bound by the UN Charter, the Geneva Conventions, that sort of thing. And Kress said, uh, generally, the United States, quote, respects international law and complies with it to the extent possible. Well, that's, that's not the same thing as saying we're bound by it and have to comply. She went on to say, uh, the, G the general counsel at CIA, when reviewing a proposed covered action proposal, is going to work with lawyers from around the interagency to ensure that we do not violate U.S. domestic law. And then note the verbiage change and to identify potential violations of international law. The idea is not to ensure there's no violation of international law. It's to ensure that this is done consciously and deliberately, not mistakenly, because it does really matter for the United States to violate international law and thus be in breach on the international plane of our duties. Um, she also noted that some domestic laws like the War Crimes Act, they incorporate by reference an international law provision. And in that way, international law becomes binding on even a covert action, but only in that way. Um, so she kind of concluded, um, the job is to make sure the director understands the implications if it's going to breach international law. But in the end, the president may, quote, nonetheless authorize the covered action activity. Now, that, Bobby, I would just jump in there. You referenced it, but I believe it was in 2012 that uh, then uh, CIA General Counsel Steve Preston uh, gave a, a speech where he talks about uh, the way in which uh, the CIA thinks about law. And if you pull up that speech, I believe, like I said, it was in 2012. One thing to pay attention to is how different the language is when he's speaking about domestic law versus international law. Um, it's all across the board about importance of law, but when it's, he's talking about domestic law, he's talking about it as uh, binding as, uh, as a, a, a true legal constraint. When he's talking about international law, he's talking about it being something that's important that the CAA looks to, strives to comply with, and so on, but is not binding in the same way. Exactly so. It's, it's, it's a critical divide. And for those who are steeped in the details of how the American legal system works in relation to international law, this may or may not be welcome, but it's understandable because we have what's called a dualist system in which there are certainly key points of intersection between international law and our domestic law, treaties most notably, but also custom has its role. Um, but it looks really weird and in fact almost sounds nonsensical to someone raised, as it were, as a lawyer in a different legal tradition. And here I want to emphasize for those who don't know about this divide, um, there are many countries in the world that don't have that dualist divide I just described, but instead their, their entire legal culture and system is monist. It's, it's a unified system in which international law is as much part of domestic law as, as the acts of their legislature. It's directly binding. It's not some separate thing that can be brushed off or, or pushed into the realm of mere policy consideration the way that at least some views of the American system and certainly this framework we just described goes. This accounts for a lot of mutual confusion, that sort of cultural divide, especially amongst allies. Some of our closest allies, their lawyers really have a hard time and certainly their academics have a hard time getting their, their minds around the idea that from just from within the perspective of our own system that this is a logical sequence of legal positions to take because you can't actually really do it that way in their system. But you can do it in our system for better or worse. We have done it in our system for better or worse. We used to never talk about it. You had to just sort of either know somebody who can give you the insight or you had to in infer it from the language uh, that I parsed a moment ago where it was implicit but not explicit. But in more recent years, as you said, Matt, we've had general counsels both at the nomination stage and in office describing really clearly how this is a critical policy consideration, but it's, but it's, uh, it's not something that binds the way that the Constitution or a statutory provision binds. So uh, rounding things out, that, that, that statute and its sort of wholesale reference to uh, some thou shalt not other statutes and constitutional provisions, it's not the only source of things. Earlier in the day when we talked about the foundations of intelligence community law, 
we talked about Executive Order 12333, the sort of organic presidential directive mapping out which parts of the IC do which things and including some rules of the road that are imposed by the president, even if statutes don't impose them also. And in some cases, statutes don't cover this ground. Um, it's critical to understand that 12333, which gets that numbering from when Reagan issued, issued it, but had existed in an earlier form under Carter and earlier than that under Ford, this is in many ways best understood as an attempt originally by the Ford administration to take some of the wind out of the sails of those reform-minded 1970s legislative efforts that did produce the finding and oversight transparency requirements. There were potentially going to be a lot of other uh, legislative interventions too, some of which would be of the much more specific thou shalt not variety, especially after the work of Frank Church's a Senate special committee investigating a whole array of intelligence activities that involved abuses uh, called for just such reform legislation. Ford and then later Carter and then later Reagan and other presidents succeeding them have helped fend off that sort of more dramatic intervention by having this framework. So, so what's in this framework that consists of thou shalt not rules that maybe matter? I'll highlight a few, this isn't all of them, but I'll highlight the ones that kind of stand out to me as being really relevant for covert action. Although there's spillover here with collection too. Um, there's an effort to soothe concerns about intelligence activity exploiting cover in the form of participation in organizations within the United States. That is to say, people going undercover, as it were, by joining a U.S. organization under false pretenses. Doing that without disclosure to the organization's leadership is, by default, a no-no, a, a thou shalt not. But it can be done. It's just that there have to be certain procedures followed, including procedures approved by the Attorney General. Um, here's here's a, a, the, the cash out there. Um, if you're going to do it in a way that's going to influence what that organization does, and these are organizations within the United States only, mind you, this isn't about foreign organizations. Um, if this is going to be done, it's going to have to be done not only with the right approvals, but in a way that pertains to a lawful investigation conducted by the FBI. So CIA can't roll in and do this, uh, even if the National Security Act already didn't already limit them. Um, and the organization anyways cannot be one that's primarily got U.S. persons as its members. Um, so there's a, there's a real attempt to try to limit that sort of especially First Amendment sensitive activity. There's a, uh, uh, a reminder of some of the more terrifying abuses that occurred during the, uh, the pre-1970s period involving experimentation without consent of the experimentee uh, with medical and pharmaceutical matters. Uh, that can't be done anymore by the executive order. And similarly, the church committee had really dug in on the topic of CIA assassinations. There was a lot of talk about legislation to ban assassinations. The executive order issued by Ford, Carter, and Reagan onward prohibits assassination. A lot of people who know a little bit about uh, the use of force and covert action understand there's an assassination ban Sometimes it is misunderstood and people don't realize there's no statute that says this. It's an executive order only. But as we've tried to emphasize, that's, that is quite real for purposes of anyone within the executive branch. The question is, what counts as assassination? It's not defined in the statute. If you go back and read carefully what the church committee report had to say about the set of activities they were denouncing, as assassination and calling for statutory bans on, I think it's fair to assume that this executive order prohibition is meant to at least somewhat, if not entirely, reflect that conception. Uh, my read of it and my sense of how the U.S. government over time has read it is that that's referring to circumstances in which the use of lethal force is not legally otherwise authorized because it's, for example, part of an armed conflict or a situation involving an imminent threat to American lives. And instead, the use of lethal force is one simply to advance, perhaps important, but nonetheless, simply to advance interest in foreign policy, like regime change, because we don't want a certain country to have influence in a particular place. Killing in that context is clearly assassination. 
that at a minimum is what this prohibits, maybe at a maximum what it prohibits. But since the executive order doesn't spill it out, we've had a lot of debate over time as a result. And rounding things off, uh, an important rule that you can't skirt any of these rules by asking someone else to do it. And uh, beyond that, Congress and presidents alike have largely stayed out of the thou shalt not game and have focused their attention in trying to manipulate incentives in the decision-making process through transparency, oversight, and decision-making rules. And maybe that's a good place to stop so we can use the remaining time for any questions we want to get in. Yeah, thanks, Bobby. So, you know, it seems that the, a major takeaway here is that covert action is a, an immense power that the executive branch can wield with uh, tremendous consequences. Uh, and the and sort of the major check on it is a very peculiar form of procedural requirements and notifications to congressional committees, not to the entire Congress, but to a small group of uh, congressional members in both houses of Congress that in a sense sit as a, a, a proxy for um, the legislative branch uh, and perhaps the, the public more generally. So let's talk about whether that system works. Is that an effective check? And uh, I think the, the many of the questions that I've gotten along the way are looking at, are asking about examples of this. So, so let me give you one and get your take on it. Um, one of the uh, sort of most uh, uh, significant or high profile investigations that the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee engaged in during the Obama administration was reviewing the CIA's uh, detention, rendition, and interrogation program during the Bush administration, the so-called Black Sites program. Uh, I, do you see that as an example showing the effectiveness of congressional oversight of covert action, or does that show the weakness of it? It's a hard one to answer because it's, it's so hotly contested what the, the ground truth of the situation is regarding the process of that investigation. There, there, are, there are those who would say that the, the Senate Select Committee got to the ground truth and did a signal service in terms of democratic accountability by creating a, a reliable record of exactly what had transpired in the interrogation program. Uh, and then there are those who say that the, the thing was politicized and didn't present a fair account, the CIA proponents who say that you can't exactly trust at least some parts of it and, and I'm certainly, I'm not personally in a position to, to know who's got the better of that argument. Um, but I think the right way to think about it for purposes of this dialogue is, did that intervention, whether it was entirely accurate in its details or not, did it really make a difference? Um, one might say, well, how could it? It came so many years later. Um, well, in the short term, maybe it didn't make a difference because it came later. But I think the case for it mattering as strong as as to going forward from from the moments when it began to become clear what was going on in that investigation and how that investigation unfolded, the lesson in the, uh, the signal with, to Langley, to the CIA in general, for anyone who's paying any attention, and certainly everyone was, and would continue to remember the lesson for a long time, is that going into anything resembling that space has the potential to produce this kind of outcome. Very, very painful outcome both in terms of the, the direct experience of being in that investigation and what it might mean for careers and career development prospects, et cetera, for the persons who were spotlighted in that investigation. But then it gets interesting, like how much of the credit really goes to the Senate committee and its process and how much of it instead goes to the larger set of institutions that I think of as our watchdog ecosystem in the private sector, the journalistic enterprises and the advocacy groups. And in this case, even the filmmakers, right? Because there was a Big, big, dramatic uh, film. Adam Driver, no less, uh, made a hero in that film. So, um, and so, if there is this sort of a uh, sort of a name and shame censure sort of cost that was imposed, and thus a, a strong uh, behavior influencing uh, redirection of decision making for at least a period of time for the agency, is it because of the Senate Select Committee, or is it because the larger ecosystem? 
And I think that's a mistake to try to disentangle the two. I think that in the American system, the best and richest understanding of it is that these mechanisms, these formal legal mechanisms that ensure transparency to Congress or these parts of Congress goes hand in hand with sometimes uh, spurring and sometimes being spurred by the journalists and the advocacy groups and the watchdogs that are out there in the privacy sector. Um, I think just as it was widely understood for a generation following the mid 70s, that proposals to get involved in use of lethal force and covert action were incredibly high risk. And there was a strong deterrent element that's very visible in the historical record that we've seen publicly up through the 9-11 attacks. And it's brought out to some extent in the 9-11 commission report itself. There's, there was a hangover effect from that earlier phase. And I believe that we have a similar hangover effect going on now currently as sort of a reaction to the interrogation controversies in the way that they were spotlighted. And I think if you took the congressional reporting out of it, then the advocacy group media piece of the, of the system doesn't work nearly as well and vice versa. That's great. I, I just add a few additional points to that. One is um, we, we don't know what we don't know. Right? We're talking about how effective has oversight been of a set of activities that are supposed to be invisible and even deniable. So we only, in assessing that empirically, we sitting here in our, in our homes or in a classroom uh, or as academics, we can only assess what we can, what we can see. Uh, that's point one. A second point is one that I, I just want to amplify that, that you made, which is uh, the role of the press. Uh, you know, the, the, the United States has uh, extremely potent uh, intelligence agencies, but it also has an extremely potent press. Um, and it's a press that uh, has a lot, of, that devotes a lot of energy to trying to root out secrets. And I think it's, uh, it's 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 almost inconceivable now that uh, that any uh, administration would contemplate covert actions without thinking about the probability that it's going to come out publicly um, and needing to take account of that and figure out what their plan is for for for, for doing so. Uh, uh, and then I I would just uh, uh, add to that that because the main institutional check, if sort of formal institutional check is not courts, it's not um, legislation, though there's always, as you mentioned, the, the possibility, the threat hanging out there that if the executive branch or the CIA oversteps, um, it could face some legislative restrictions on its activity. But assuming that that's very rare in this area, the, the main formal Sort of interbranch check is the role of the intelligence committees in reviewing submissions from the executive branch and helping to, to vet them and deciding whether or not it's going to push back in any way. That's, I think, all a reason to be especially worried about a rise in partisan rancor in the, uh, in, in, in that we're currently seeing in the intelligence committees. Because when in your previous lecture, we talked about uh, the intelligence committees as being this institutional innovation. Let's create special select committees um, that are going to have some expertise in intelligence matters. And we would hope uh, operate in a more, or let, let's say more bipartisan, less partisan fashion um, in thinking about not just uh, uh, the possibility of abuse of intelligence authorities, but are, are they being used effectively in the national interest? Uh, and right now seems to be a point at which the intelligence com committees are working especially poorly uh, across the aisle um, and doing a lot more. Uh, and this, this is, a, I think, on both sides of the partisan divide, doing a lot more public speaking than we're accustomed to seeing from uh, from from congressional intelligence committees. Boy, that's right, and it's a it's a really unfortunate thing, in my opinion, because if we if we think about what happened in the '70s, it was sort of this flashpoint that that tried to come to a sustainable new equilibrium to get that balance between needing to in a dangerous world needing to have some of these activities possible. But learning from our history that if it's too much in the shadows, not enough accountability, then we're going to do 
some amount of too abusive, too stupid things. We got to try to get that better balance. Um, I don't think anyone would say that the way you get that better balance is to have a highly partisan political football sort of mechanism, try to step in as in loco parentis for the, for the, the public. The whole idea was, let's see if we can build within Congress an environment in which the partisanship could at least be mostly left at the door and they can kind of quietly operate in a good government collaborative spirit and focus on um, providing just the right amount of accountability. Um, again, it's had its ups and downs, but we're, we're really at a low point in recent years because the activities of the intelligence community have been made into political footballs. Some, some would say that the intelligence com community, certain people have made it into political footballs. I'm not trying to pin the rose on anyone in particular, although I have my own views about, about this. Uh, I do think descriptively, the reality is more so on the House side than the Senate side, but especially on the House side, um, it, it doesn't feel different than the Judiciary Committee or certain other committees that aren't known for their bipartisan hands across the aisle approach. And that means that the ability of the American people writ large to posit trust in this mechanism as stepping in as a good government kind of proxy, closing the democratic accountability deficit is much reduced. And, uh, and that means it may not be stable and we may be heading for a new pendulum swing at some point. Uh, well, that brings us uh, to the end of today's session. I wanna thank Bobby for being with us uh, today. Uh, thank you, thank you again. And thank you all for joining.